Mexican officials uh, would not always let the tent stay up. So they would let them sleep in a tent for a night. Uh, Mexican officials would tear them down themselves. And then we would have to bring more tents out. This went on for a while. They were very much against the tents, but at the same time, the crowds of 20 turned into 100, and then it turned into 200. And they realized that these people needed some place to stay. Um, Mexico was not going to like fully take them in, even though Mexico has been incredibly kind. They let asylum seekers stay, which everyone knows here is a US responsibility. They belong to us. Trump turned his back on them and Mexico didn't have to let them stay, but they allowed thousands, about 60,000 at, at its highest to stay in Mexico. Um, in the beginning, Madame Morris was not the only one that had Tent City 1 and Tent City 2. It was also in Juarez all along the border. There were Tent Cities and which formed encampments. Uh, there were three in Juarez. Right now, as we speak today, there is an encampment in Tijuana that's forming under Biden's administration that I don't think most people know about. It's there. Uh, I did not download that picture in the video that I just got last night, but there is a new, brand new encampment going up right now as we sit here. So back to 2019. 2019, Trump implemented MPP, which brought a halt to people crossing into the US. Tent City One then turned into Tent City Two, which stretched about a mile. Um, I would say after this presentation, if you have time to please go to the Sidewalk School Facebook page I have posted almost every single day since the school started, August 11th, 2019, and you can watch the progression through my pictures yourself. I also posted videos. You can see where school used to take place next to trash bins and sewers uh, because Mexican officials did not allow us to have any sort of permanent structures. So we had to move and sit wherever we were allowed to for that day. So it was often in trash. And you'll see we put cardboard boxes down to make it, you know, kind of more livable as we taught school uh, next to the sewer. Um, it's been a lot. When Tent City 2 was formed, which went on to Tent City 1 across the bridge and into Madame Morris, they stopped it right at the gate. It became a discussion of what they would do. Mexico, this was not a good look for them. They didn't like it and they didn't want them there. The United States, what we did was we ignored it completely and turned our back to it and pretended like it wasn't there and that this was not a US created problem. So there was not much publicity about what was going on during that time and the conditions these people had to live through. Um, but once again, you can see for yourself, go back 2019 on my Facebook page and you can see the progression of it, the time, the kids, the same faces you saw in 2019, you will see in pictures today on March 2nd, 2021, you'll see the same kids in the pictures. That's how long they've been living outside. Now the kids got pushed back into the encampment because Mexico couldn't take it anymore at the height in, in that encampment, which is outside in the woods next to the Rio Grande River, we had almost 5,000 people live out there. I had almost 700 students inside that encampment. And as I said, if you missed the beginning part, I am not a 501c3. We live off of GoFundMe, which has not been enough. And uh, you can look at the GoFundMe. We have not made a lot <laughs> since 2019. We have not. Uh, we've also depended upon activists who have been with us uh, from the beginning, who have become very good friends of mine over this time period, who have donated thousands of their own dollars uh, just so these kids can go on. So 
With all that being said, as you can imagine, schooling in Mexico was not easy for the children asylum seekers because they are not wanted in Mexico. Um, they tried to bust them to school back in 2019, early 2019. The problem with that was other kids would beat them up, taunt them, uh, do horrible things to them because they were kids who lived outside in tents. They were called horrific names. Uh, it lasted not even a week before the parents said no, they wouldn't send their children to that situation anymore. And schooling stopped altogether for them. The sidewalk school started because I became friends with a little girl who at the time was only living outside for a month. And I say only a month because I've people have lived out there for two years now. So a month was nothing, trust me. But that month, she went from always running up to me, talking to me about her Twilight books in Spanish. Uh, like, and I was buying her like, little gifts because I was crossing every day on my own. I used to be a housewife before all this. Um, she went from running up to me saying hi and us doing butterfly thing pictures together to she stopped talking. She stopped coming out of her tent. And whenever I would happen to see her because her mother would open the tent and I could see inside of it, her appearance even changed. And I had never seen a child go through severe depression like that in my whole life. I didn't even know children could be that severely depressed to where even their appearance changed. But I saw it happen with her. I started the sidewalk school right after she left. She got to cross, thank God. <laughs> I was so happy when their turn came up. The school started right after she left because it wasn't just her going through that. It was hundreds of other kids now starting going through the same severe depression because all they had to do all day was sit there and wait and worry whether or not they got to cross. And if they were gonna eat and if they had clothes and shoes, that's a hard thing to sit with, with nothing else going on around you. So I started it, but I started it with a lot of caveats to it. I only hire asylum seekers. I don't bring in volunteers. I don't bring in Americans. And the Sidewalk School organization, myself and Victor Cavazos are the only two Americans. And I keep it that way on purpose. I hire from within the community that the sidewalk school works in. We will be starting in Reynosa next week. I'm hiring from the Haitian community, teachers, teachers aides. We will be going to Tijuana, hopefully within a month. Hopefully, a lot's going on down here. Uh, but when I do, I will be hiring from inside their encampment. We often get volunteers and I really appreciate it and I love it, uh, but we don't take them. <laughs> uh, our teachers, all of our teachers, all have degrees from their home countries, every single last one. We even have a teacher with a master's degree from in a communications from Panama working for us. Now, with that being said, I can't pay them what they are worth. I can't. We have a teacher that used to be a doctor in Cuba. She's been with me for over a year. Her name is Elizabeth. I love Elizabeth. They're great. They're educated. They're underpaid by me because I, I don't have the money to pay them more. If I had more, I would, because they are definitely worth it. They work five days a week, um, but we don't receive grants. The first year, and actually still to this day, there aren't a lot of grants for people who, American who works in Matamoras inside an encampment for asylum seekers. We do not fit any of those boxes. We don't. <laughs> we got a grant one time because the oh, or the director happened to come watch the school. It touched her. Then she reached back out to me and said, okay, I want to give you some money. But that's how we got the grant. Besides that, I used to search for hours and we just didn't fit anything that serves asylum seekers stuck in the situation that they're in, even though it is a US created problem. But I digress. <laughs> so all of our staff, right now there's 20, uh, are all asylum seekers. 
Um, we used to do school in person uh, at the Madam Morris encampment. Are actually in front of Tent City too. When you go back, you can see the pictures from Tent City too. We were then pushed into the encampment when they were pushed into the encampment. We had two tents, the kinder tent and the white tent was for the older children. And then COVID hit. When COVID hit, uh, Mexican immigration wanted all the organizations to leave. And I refused. I already knew what would happen if school left and I wasn't gonna let that, that happen. So when I say I spent all of my savings and I'm now touching my retirement fund, we have bought over 270 Amazon Fire tablets and I passed it out to each student. Take your time, Felicia. I wanted to be so that they could attend school no matter where they were. And that is what the sidewalk school is. School takes place five days a week. We are in mountain time and central time. Here in central time where I am, it starts at 10 a.m. It ends at 6.30 p.m. Um, students, we do take attendance. All of our staff members have laptops. Uh, we are completely electronic. Everything is through Zoom. Um, grades are given. Papers are corrected and given back. Parents are spoken to. Um, and students are also moved around. If a student is very clearly behind, which a lot of the students are, sadly, because of where they're coming from. A lot of them weren't even going to school in their own country. So we had a lot of older students who couldn't read or write. But before Zoom, uh, they would not attend school because they were embarrassed. After COVID, COVID has been a blessing to the sidewalk school, believe it or not, in many different ways. The older students don't have to be seen, so they attend classes and they learn how to read and write. We have expanded. We are now in eight cities across Mexico. Tijuana would be number nine for us. And we continue to expand. Shelters contact us, asking us to go to them. Organizations contact us now, asking if we can go to where they are. If you can believe it or not, with me and Victor being the only two Americans and the only ones able to cross back and forth, we were a very small operation. We are now hiring because we can no longer just do it between the two of us. And also now our teachers are crossing. Um, as we speak, I have six people living with me. They just crossed within the last two days and they're my staff members with their families here in my house. We are now hoping for other staff members to go ahead and cross. And when they do, everyone's welcome to stay. Um, but school has to continue on. <laughs> um, besides school, we are also a rapid response organization. We feed everyone daily, lunch, breakfast, dinner. Right now we're feeding the entire encampment, myself and Victor Cavazos. Um, we also give out clothing, we do shoes, we pay for medicine, we pay for specialists. Because as you can imagine, a lot of kids have unique problems. Um, that Mexico won't pay for, uh, that we pay for. Uh, we also house people. We, we buy tents, uh, air mattresses, fans. When the cold snap hit Houston, I think that was a week ago, forgive me, my time is kind of off. Uh, we bought large heaters and spread them out throughout the encampment so these kids could get some heat. We do just about everything, just about everything. If something is needed, parents often call me and ask. For all of our staff members, we found lawyers. For all of those who have lost their cases, like two of my staff members, we help them file appeals. Um, we help them find better living situations. 
Um, besides that, to go back to the education part, we do all this because we know the child can't concentrate. It's chaos, as you can imagine, period, living inside an encampment. But much less if you're hungry, if you don't have clothes, if you don't have shoes, if you don't have underwear, socks, if you have lice, if you have outbreaks of lice many times, we had to buy lice kits and combs. Um, we try to make it so the kid can focus on the school every single day. We even started a daycare for a little while before the Mexican officials made us stop because the older kids were watching the babies because the parents needed a break, which I totally understand. It's a stressful situation. Everybody needed a break in my opinion, but the parents would send the babies to school with their older siblings. So then I hired another asylum seeker to watch the babies so the older siblings can concentrate in class and not have to watch their baby brother or sister. So with that being said, let me see if I can share some pictures with you, all of you. Let's see. Okay, so we also have a STEM class that we started. Science and math are very important. <laughs> um, so these are, this picture I think was taken maybe only three weeks ago or less. And that little boy in the blue cap is still inside the encampment today. I just served him uh, lunch, dinner. Very nice young man. Um, oh no, it went away. Give me one. Oh, there it is. Oh, but it's not screen sharing. Hold on. So much to learn. Share it. And this is our kinder tent. So we had um, two kinder classes. Inside the encampment are more babies and toddlers than there are teenagers and like preteens. There I'm not, are. I'm not seeing a picture, Felicia. I'm just seeing your link. You know all your files there. Oh no. That's what I see. It's just all the JPEG files, but I'm not seeing an image. Anybody else have that problem? Uh, say, same, Felicia. I was about to, to say the same. Maybe, yeah, maybe if you just click and open it up for us. Mm -hmm. I'm not sure why you see it and we don't. I wish I could just be on my phone and show my phone. <laughs> well, we could try it. We may have to if I can't get, so you well, see all the files. You know what? I think you're just sharing the wrong screen with us. So oh. you have multiple ones open. You are correct. Hold on. Now, right now, as we speak, my phone keeps going off. Okay, stop it. There and there. Thank you. And Thank you, Maddie Waters, for suggesting the same. Nope, it will not do it. Can I show my phone? <laughs> Hold it up. Because I don't think I can see my face, so you can probably see my phone at the same time. I right, so this is what's happening. People are crossing now from the encampment. And what's happening is we're having to receive them. So besides running school in a bunch of different cities, um, I'm also trying to cross back and get my staff as they cross here into the US and take them to wherever they need to go or if they need to live with me for a while, I bring them to my house. So it has not left much time for me to get a, a nice presentation together and I apologize. Um, this is a picture of people arriving today in Brownsville, Texas at the bus station from the encampment directly. Uh oh, there we go. Yep, that works. All right, perfect. <laughs> then if this way, then I can show you more. This picture was taken today from inside the encampment. So they've enclosed the encampment a long time ago with a fence and barbed wire at the top with one entrance and one exit. You can see that as them protecting the asylum seekers or you can see it as a prison. Right now there's a lock on the one entrance and one exit so they can't exit. So you can take that as you wanna take it. 
they put these signs up all around the encampment recently uh, because of the emotional stress everyone is going through. Uh, they are not letting people cross like all together. You have to wait for your name to be called. So it's like metering, metering all over again. But what was once 1,000 asylum seekers when Biden won, which was not that long ago, is now down to less than 100. So if you can imagine less than 100, the encampment is now being taken down and you're still sitting in there. It's a panic because now they're like, are we crossing or not? And the answer they have been given so far is they don't know. So they put those signs up today. If you're going through an emotional emergency, you can call this number. This is one of my staff members giving out food. Um, I will tell you the story about Enrique and Melvin. They've been with the sidewalk school for over a year. They are wonderful. This is how this, this encampment looks today. You can see everything's coming down from inside that camp, everything. Uh, which is also causing the people who are still stuck there a lot of panic. Um, this is us serving, can you see the little boy in the video? Probably not, I think he's in there. Us serving lunch dinner uh, just a few hours ago outside the camp gate to the people who are left in the camp. And as you see, children are still left inside that encampment. They have not been allowed to cross. Um, this is some of the food we bought today for the people still left inside the encampment. So what they've been doing recently is they've been scavenging through empty tents for food and water. Um, it is the sidewalk school and the clinic. We're the last two left inside the camp. The other organizations I'm not saying that they left, but they're concentrating on the people who are currently crossing into Brownsville. So the other, if you are a fan of, in, of any of the other organizations down here, they are still working. They have not left. It's just they're concentrating on the US side right now. And myself or the sidewalk school and the clinic are still concentrating on the people who are still stuck inside that encampment. Um, well, I'm trying to pick and choose like what to show you, all of you. Um, this is one of our staff members leaving just yesterday, the encampment. People come to say goodbye whenever someone gets the lucky call and their name gets called. You have so many minutes to gather your belongings, say goodbye, and you're put into a van and you go. I'm gonna take a minute uh, because the pictures that I want to show you, like this painting. And this painting. And this painting is called Peace of Mind. And this painting was all done by an asylum seeker. Uh, he is a staff member of the sidewalk school. His name is Melvin. He has had no previous training in art. He's just a natural talent. His, he's done other paintings. They're absolutely gorgeous. Melvin was shot six times in his home country in the upper body. He is missing part of his ear. And you can also see where the bullet went down his neck and on the back. It's permanent scarring from where they tried to shoot him in the head and kill him. He also walks with a pronounced limp because they shot him in his kneecaps. And Melvin, and lucky for Melvin, was 20 years old when this happened. So he survived it. Where I think his other people, he was also shot in his stomach, his rib cage, his shoulder, his arm. So as other people survived it, other people would have died, he survived. He came here to Matamoros, Mexico with his brother, who was also beaten up in the same attack and also shot at. And then they were then kidnapped by the cartel for five days and were taken to Reynosa and held. We had to pay $3,000 to get them out. 
they went to trial with all of this. They have a recording of their kidnapping. Melvin made the front page in his country for surviving that attack because no one could believe Melvin survived that attack. They were both denied asylum in the US because the judge said they could not prove that Melvin would get shot again and they, they both could not prove that they would be kidnapped again if they stayed in Matamoros. Now we all know US, Mexico is flagged, right? It's dangerous. They tell us we shouldn't go there. And they were kidnapped and held and things happened to them. Um, it's not my place to go into details about what happened to them during those five days, uh, but things, awful things happened to them. But they were still both denied asylum. And right now they sit inside that encampment. Um, the people left in that camp are people who have been denied asylum and who also lost that their appeal, which fits Melvin and Enrique. Um, I have been advocating for them for the longest time. Um, they're not the only ones who deserve another chance at asylum. Uh, there are thousands of cases like Melvin and Enrique's. Uh, very clear cut cases of credible fear, which is what they're supposed to prove, which, which I felt as if they did prove, but a US judge felt they did not. At the time of their trial, it was when uh, I think towards the end of Trump's administration when uh, I think enough lawyers sued to where we were then able to go into these tent courts and witness what was going on. So I can tell you for a fact what was going on. They were only allowed maybe two interpreters to go from tent to tent, from room to room. They had little mobile rooms set up next to each other and tents set up next to each other. And you're talking about two people who have to work 10 hour days who are tired. So if Melvin's telling you I was shot six times and telling you this is where I was shot and showing you the scars on his body, the interpreter would say he was shot, but he survived. That's it. So no one's really hearing the details of Melvin's story, the emotion of Melvin's story. Melvin has siblings, parents, um, are of Enrique who witnessed his brother almost die in the street, who tried to grab his brother, but then was beat up and then shot at himself trying to save his brother's life. The only thing the judge heard was that Enrique, uh, Melvin was shot, but he survived it. So a lot got cut out during that trial, a lot. Those trials were extremely unfair. So if you're asking how this all ties to the sidewalk school, it ties to it because we do attend the hearings as emotional support, not only for not only for the children, uh, but for their parents, because a child can't can't go to school if their their parent is falling apart. And as you can imagine, almost all of them were falling apart. All of them. They needed some sort of support, emotional support, someone to show up for them. And we did. We would go and sit there. We've taken on a lot <laughs> as a school, um, but education, believe it or not, is our number one priority. That's why we press on. So with that, Julie, I'm finished and I, I'm open to any questions anyone would like to ask me. I'm kind of speechless. Thank you, Felicia. I had um, invited you having heard a brief radio story about your work and then of course was reading some of the other off your website and Facebook and other um, um, media coverage. I had no awareness of the how extensive your support goes to the point of emotional support at hearings. Um, Um, you all are welcome to put any questions or comments in the chat. Um, we could try hands up if you want to um, share your voice. We can try either way. Um, I, I will ask in the meantime, you mentioned the um, patients. 
that you've been encountering and including in the school and teaching, where all are you seeing um, migrants coming from in the cities where you're working? Central America, obviously. Um, Central America. Yeah. yeah. Um, most of our teachers are Cubans. Okay. Uh, it just happened to work out that way. Um, uh, now, currently today, that encampment is full of Haitians and Africans, asylum seekers. So now that's where the bulk of, of the problem is lying. Uh, Biden was deporting them at an incredible speed, maybe three weeks ago, or he would dump them in Mexico. They would drive them from the US across the bridge. And once they cross the bridge into Mexico, tell all the families to get out which causes a problem in Mexico, which is why we are now in Reynosa. It's a huge Haitian community that we're now gonna be in uh, where families have been dumped off and Mexico won't allow them to claim asylum because it puts them in a, in a very peculiar kind of case. You know, you were in the US, but the US dumped you over here. So the lawyers are still kind of trying to work that out with them, but we have lawyers working on that. Um. There was a question from Maddie who had to leave early, but who wrote, you are amazing, Felicia. Thank you for all you do. I'm so sorry that I had to leave earlier. Your stories will stay with me and I'll follow up. Um, from Gloria um, asking, how can we support you? What is written on your work and where can we cite it and get the recording of the presentation? The recording is through the Center for Latin American and Caribbean Studies. Um, so you can be in touch with me, Julie Klein, after. Um, but I'll leave you to answer the rest of the inquiry. Um, so I try, I do post six to seven days a week. And funny how it's helped out like 2021 when we started out, like no one knew about us. But people who did donate, <laughs> I just wanted to be transparent about their money. And so whenever someone did write about us, like I would post about it. So if you wanna see articles written about us, go to our Facebook page and scroll through. You'll see all the articles ever written about the sidewalk school. Um, and then, do I have permission to share your story? Oh yes, please do, yes, <laughs> please share our story. Uh, I like to mention a fun fact, I don't speak Spanish. So <laughs> this has been, uh, a huge learning experience for me in a lot of different ways. Um, but I also like to think I'm an example for people. Uh, if you want to help someone, you don't have to speak the language. I have created eight, about to be nine schools in a country I'm not even from, and a language I don't even speak. But it's possible. You can do it. Any more questions? While we're waiting for other questions, I, I wonder if without sharing um, detail that you cannot, just if there are other stories of your staff and teachers and um, just just to have more faces and stories associated with what you're what you're sharing. Sure. Currently, besides Enrique and Melvin being stuck inside the encampment, um, one of my teachers named Tito, who was one of the original staff members, he used to be in on the discussion. So I was like, what if we started school? Because my friends at that time were all asylum seekers, because that's who I was seeing every day and who I was serving. And uh, his best friend, Ray, who is still with the school, he's now here in the US. Uh, he's the academic director, he used to be a professor in Cuba. And Tito used to be a banker in, in Cuba. And we would all sit around at the time when they would serve dinner, you would sit on the ground because they were living outside. So we would all sit on the ground on the sidewalk and we would just eat and talk about it. And Tito was in on the discussions. Tito swam across the river about three weeks ago. He was denied asylum. He lost his appeal. He had given up hope. And he, he did something that's really risky and swam across the river, turned himself over to Border Patrol. And he is still in detention. Um, if you start following the sidewalk school, then you'll see my post tonight. It's gonna to be dedicated to Tito. 
um, because Tito needs to be out at this point. He's been held in solitude or by himself for over two weeks now. They say it's because of COVID, but it's been over two weeks and he's still locked in a room alone. So I'm, I'm about to contact some reporters and I'm about to scream about that. Either they release him or from detention or put him in general population. But locking him up for over two weeks, that's a form of torture in my opinion. Um, I'm sorry. I'm reading a question, I'm sorry. Thank you so much for everything you have done and continue to do. Your system of care is a model. Yes, since so many are fleeing situations, and national system agree with that amount. I know. So, you know, Biden has come in. I, I actually meant to talk about Biden and his transition team. Um, so maybe two weeks ago, maybe a little bit longer, they have been coming into our meetings. They have. I will give Biden credit for that and his transition team. They come into our chats. We were seeing them every single day for a little while. Uh, Secretary Mayorkas did a meeting with all of our organizations. Uh, he let us ask questions, opened it, opened it up. What he couldn't answer, he brought in one of his team members who was right there next to him and, and told them to answer the question if he didn't know the correct answer for it. Biden has, has kept his word. He has. Um, I just wish he would give people a second chance at it and not lock people in detention up in a room for over two weeks. But besides that, everything else, Biden has been great. I have, Biden is a great president. I will say that. Um, what Biden has not done though, is financially support organizations like mine. I still have not received one penny from the government to support anything that I do across Mexico. And to be really honest, we've been doing the job that they should have been doing two years ago. And we still have not received any support from the US government. But hopefully that will change. Um, and also releasing people in detention, but that's a side note. Um, what are your current goals for the sidewalk school? Yeah, that's... So we are gonna continue on, even though people will be crossing, it's not gonna be a, a fast process. Um, we will continue in Mexico. We are moving to Malawi, Africa uh, towards the end of this year uh, to be into, uh, get into another refugee camp that's been there for 10 years, I believe. We're partnering with the Refugee Outreach Collective who's been there for a couple of years. Um, we're looking at properties now to build a school. So the sidewalk school will continue on in different countries. Um, looking back into our history with Truman Latinos, I really mean, um, so I am Mexican. Uh, <laughs> I am. My father was raised during that time where you got in trouble if you spoke Spanish in school. So when my sisters and I were born, he did not want us speaking Spanish and told my mom not to allow it. So that's why we don't know Spanish, even though we are Mexican. <sighs> Has the treatment got any better? So I've worked inside the encampment, so my answer will be an automatic no. They're, they're living in horrific conditions. Um, at the border, at least. At the border, at least, I'm gonna say no, because that's where my job is. Um, how can we support your work? So we are always looking for donations. You can donate through sidewalkschool.org. Um, we need to update the website, but that gives us general information, but the, the website is outdated. Um, it doesn't include all the cities or all the staff. Um, but please donate through sidewalkschool.org. The money will be used for clothing, blankets, school supplies. Um, all the cities that we're in, we mail school supplies and backpacks to all of our students across Mexico. So everyone gets the same backpack full of stuff along with their Amazon Fire tablet. Uh, so they can start 10 classes along with the schedule, along with the, the teacher's name. We have a welcome packet. Uh, we've been doing this for a little while now, um, so we've gotten better at it, um, but that's what the money is used for, is to support the children and their families at times. Um, also, I want to point out that the school did start 
in August 11th, 2019. And it should say something that we have expanded so quickly. This is only 2021. Uh, I think I'm happy we can expand. And then I'm also incredibly sad that we are expanding so quickly and that we do have to put people off because we don't have the manpower nor really the money to go to all the places that are now calling us to please go into. Our furthest city that we're in is Celaya. And I don't know if people are aware of where Celaya is, but that's deep into Mexico, but that we are in Celaya. And also we uh, have yoga classes. I don't think I mentioned that earlier either. We uh, have three volunteer yoga instructors who are based here in the US. They're the first ones I allowed into the sidewalk school because none of the asylum seekers were certified yoga instructors. Um, but uh, our kids, they take yoga classes uh, multiple times during the week. It's a meditation period. And they also do positive reinforcement with our students throughout the week, because that's also important. Um, For those of you who uh, weren't here at the beginning of the chat, I reposted the website and also the Facebook page. Um, oh, thank you. Oh, yes, please stay in touch uh, with me. If you message on any of our social media, usually it's me answering. <laughs> and the posts are usually all me as well. I uh, try to keep all of that going at the same time because I know that's how we're able to bring money in. Um, thank you. Oh, any more questions or do you want me to tell you about another staff member, uh, Jolie? Why don't you go ahead and if questions come in, we'll have them after. Okay. Um, after Tito, uh, tonight's post will be de dedicated to Tito. We do have another staff member named Gabby who came here with her four-year-old son at the time. He's now six. His name is Joseph. Um, they were born in Honduras, which as you know, uh, Central American countries, people from there usually get denied automatically. And she falls into that category. She was fleeing from gang violence. Um, she's been denied asylum. And what happened was for her appeal, she did have a lawyer who filed an appeal for her. But her case was recently closed. When I say recent, I mean yesterday. Um, so we're now having another lawyer go back in and try to reopen the case and see why they closed her case. Um, because two lawyers agreed that it shouldn't have been closed. So we're not too sure. Uh, Gabby is obviously in a panic mode right now. She messages me a lot throughout the day asking what's going to happen to her along with Enrique and Melvin, who also messaged me throughout the day asking what's gonna to happen to them. Um, all this while school still has to continue. So we take on a lot. I think people often uh, forget, I do have a nine-year-old son myself, but I, I try to cover, I try to cover everyone. Um, I do want to say a happy story about one of our teachers, which is Ray Rodriguez. He got to cross last year in January. He has not been granted asylum, but he is still here. He now lives in DC. He works for a church uh, with the LGBTQ community. Um, Ray will be flying down here to Brownsville next week to surprise the teachers uh, that he used to live with before he crossed into the US. Uh, so when they cross, they get to see Ray's face. So I'm really excited that he's gonna surprise the teachers over here on this side. Um, oh, does the school year calendar include breaks? No, because they live inside the encampment because of their situation, our school goes 365 days a year. We have no breaks. Um, but we do celebrate holidays in Mexico, Mexican holidays, and sometimes American holidays. We celebrate Martin Luther King's birthday. <laughs> um, just so, 
So I should mention this about the sidewalk school. We are a mixture of Mexican curric Mexico curriculum and their holidays. Oh, Victor, can you get the door? And we are also a mixture of American uh, curriculum and American holidays because the kids are trying to get here to the US. So I do want them to get used to what they will see when they do arrive here. Uh, we do have accreditation in Juarez, Mexico by the Mexican government, but before they stepped in, we were completely American and they stepped in. They're like, you can't do that. <laughs> They're like, you're in our country. You have to put in Mexico curriculum. So I was like, can we meet halfway? Can we do half you and half us? And they were like, sure. So now the school is half and half. But before the accreditation in Juarez, we were completely American because I thought the kids should see what they would see when they get here to the US. And so that's how the school was initially structured. And the Cuban teachers, uh, they were very flexible. They, they were like, okay. And they start learning American history as well stuff. People they've never heard of or seen. And um, I start learning Mexican history people have never heard of or seen. So it's worked out great both ways. Uh, Alicia, have you, I imagine you've seen some really strong friendships develop among kids in the school or between families. Yes. I, want, I wonder if you could highlight a couple of those. Yes, I will. Um, I'm going to turn my camera off for one minute because I have to change rooms. I'm sorry, I have a lot of people at my house right now. So I have to switch rooms, but I'm going to turn the camera off, but I will continue talking. All right, sounds good. Um, right now, as we speak, uh, we have our, my kinder, our, the sidewalk school kinder teacher, Sandra, uh, living with me with her 13-year-old son. And there has been a picture circulating of Sandra hugging one of her students goodbye. Um, if I can, oof, this is not a good background. Okay, so the background you're about to see is my garage with donations for <laughs> Renusa that we have to cross this later this week. Um, but here we go. Behind me are the donations for our families in Reynosa. Blankets, jackets, underwear, socks, um, toys, diapers, milk, um, food that, you know, like uh, granola bars, breakfast bars. Uh, I asked for all of that as donations from people. Stuff that's, that can be eaten outside, basically. But this is a picture that's been circulating for the past two or three days that caught a lot of people's attention from teacher Sandra. Mm -hmm. And this is her student. He got the call uh, that he and his family were going to cross and it just broke them down. Teacher Sandra crossed yesterday. She's now here in my house. But I don't think people realize like this is their community for two years. Uh, so it not only are you leaving an encampment of living outside in the woods and taking showers outside and going to the bathroom outside, but you're now leaving the people that supported you. We have another comment in the chat from Raul. I'm so moved by your work and everything you represent. Thank you for sharing so much of it with us. How do you work with your own self-care even as you're caring for so many others? I don't. <laughs> People always tell me, take care of yourself. Uh, but this type of work and the type of support that's needed on all fronts, just so a child can concentrate. So the sidewalk school, we're not like the US school in that a child goes to school all day because that's too much for them. It's too much. And I wouldn't expect any child in that situation to be able to sit through classes for six, seven hours. They can't, it's impossible. They go to class every day for one hour and then they go to yoga class, which is 30 minutes. And then recently we're starting, we start after school programs that can be done via Zoom. And then that's only one hour as well. And that's if you wanna attend the after school program. 
but their lives are so difficult and it's so hard. So it doesn't stop. I'm always getting phone calls from parents who lost an appeal, who's been denied, who, whose son ran away and they found him dead in McAllen on the other side of the border somehow. How could that happen? I'm always looking for lawyers. Lawyers are like gold to me, especially if you can volunteer your time the way these lawyers have down here. I'm always looking for someone to give someone $20 so they can eat tonight, especially if they're in a city far away from me. If you're in Matamoros, I can just cross and buy you food or give you the money yourself. But if you're far away from me, I have to make phone calls to see who can feed you and your family tonight. So there isn't really time for self-care because I'm always trying to figure something out for somebody else. Because I recognize I am in a very privileged position, which I am. I'm extremely privileged. The fact that I can sit here in the garage with all this stuff around me shows me how privileged I am. So no self-care. Maybe one day, <laughs> maybe after this kind of slows down. After you start a new school in Malawi, for example, and <laughs> Yes, we will be going to Africa, hopefully at the end of this year, early next year. COVID set Malawi back, um, but the kids there, that's a whole other <laughs> story. But yes, I don't, I don't know if self-care is really needed for me, at least for me. I seem to thrive on what I do. And I guess if it ever gets too bad, every once in a while I run off to Houston. That's where I'm originally from. I'm not from Brownsville. And I go and I hang out with my mom and my sisters, maybe three or four days. And then I come back and then it starts up. And then I'll go back maybe in two months and hang out with my mom again for three or four days. I guess that's the self-care. It doesn't happen often though. I so appreciate your time. Um, this, this has certainly been one of the most meaningful programs that we've been involved with. So I appreciate your time very much. Um, please share with your staff and your teachers how much we admire what they're doing. Of course, of course. Did you wanna talk about our indigenous students? Please. The indigenous students, sadly, we could not help as much as we help the other students who speak Spanish. So this is, this is what most children have learned how to do, which is speak Spanish. Even our Haitian students who are just coming in speak Spanish. And their uh, native language is French Creole or Portuguese. In Portuguese, um, I actually had to dip into it for some of our other students. So when people say Spanish and Portuguese are the same, kind of not really. <laughs> some words are completely different from Spanish. Um, so what's happened with the indigenous students is they all left as a community, at least I've met a Morris and they moved to some apartments and they have been out of school the entire two years. Uh, we have tried multiple times to find people who speak their language. We cannot. We cannot. Even when uh, someone's organization's name, Indigenous such and such, and you contact them and like, hey, do you speak this language? Do you understand what they're saying? The answer has always been no. So children who do not speak Spanish, who do not speak French, who do not speak Portuguese, have been out of school for a solid two years and continuing to be out of school. Although you don't take volunteers, I'm gonna share with you after this information on centers like ours around the country who actually support the study of indigenous languages, the Americas. So mm -hmm. there might be a connection to be made in that way. 
I will. So I make exceptions for volunteers. If an asylum <laughs> seeker can't do it, then I'm more than happy to bring an American in. <laughs> and um, these indigenous students, good gosh, we need somebody. Yeah, I will. I'm going to send you an email after this. Um, we've um, reached the end of our time. Um, again, Felicia, this is incredible. I so admire what you're doing. I've never met anybody like you before with so much heart. Um, and because you show so much heart, I find Zoom a little uh, a little too uh, empty of voices and faces. So I wonder if those of you willing, if you would turn on your mics, turn on your cameras, if you're comfortable, applaud, say thank you, something just so we have people all together. Thank you. Oh, nice. Hi, everybody. Thank you so much. Good job. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Oh, wow. Thanks. It's nice to see people. COVID's really <laughs> <laughs> taking people away. Thank you, everybody, for joining us. Yeah. Bye, you. everybody. And well, please continue uh, to follow the sidewalk school. <laughs> Will do. Bye. Bye, guys. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, Julie. Gracias. Ciao. De nada.